The crowd filled the alley. The afternoon was just beginning at Piccadilly Circus. Everyone was fighting to get into the Egyptian Hall. For only two shillings, they would have the chance to see the greatest attraction London had to offer in 1810. On the stage was a voluptuous woman, practically naked. Men, women, and children all looked at her, some with astonishment, others with desire, but no one with indifference. She was shown obscenely and cruelly as a primitive freak, as a person as strange as she was painfully inferior. Her name was Sarah Bartman, an African woman torn from her home to be forced into these spectacles. Stay until the end and discover the story of the Hottentot Venus, from the beginning, Sarah's life was marked not only by injustices but also by paradoxes. The first is that she was born in 1789, the year of the French Revolution, the one that brought the ideas of equality, liberty, and fraternity to the world, but not in her world. She was born on the Gamtuz River, now known as the Eastern Cape, a province of South Africa, to the Khoikhoi pastoral tribe. Her mother died when she was two, and her father soon after. As soon as she reached her teens, she married a young drummer. They had a son who died shortly after birth. When she was barely 16, Dutch settlers murdered her husband. At that time, Sarah was sold to Peter Willem Tezar, a trader who took her to Cape Town. He christened her Sarchi, the Dutch diminutive for Sarah, abused her, and enslaved her by forcing her to do backbreaking domestic work. But that was far from the worst that was to happen in her life. In October 1810, Sarah, then 21 years old, met William Dunlop, an English surgeon, at the home of her master. The man, who was traveling aboard a British ship, was a friend of Peter's brother, Hendrick. As she was illiterate, she signed a contract on October 29th of the same year, in which she undertook to travel to England with the two men. The idea, as she was told, was that the young woman would work as a maid, and on weekends, she would be exhibited at various exhibitions. According to the agreement, she would receive a share of the profits from the shows, and five years later, around 1816, she would be allowed to return to South Africa. And off they went, the three of them together, to Great Britain, not knowing that it would be Sarah's longest nightmare. The group lived in a comfortable house on Duke Street in St. James's, the most elegant part of London at the beginning of the 19th century. There were Sarah, Hendrick, Dunlop, and two African children, probably also brought illegally from Cape Town. The Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly Circus was chosen to exhibit Sarah, at a time when that street was overflowing with such oddities as the ugliest man or the world's greatest deformity, the stakes had to be high to succeed. Dunlop presented her as if she were an extraordinary freak of nature. In a cage, her body was half-naked, barely covered by a tight garment the color of her skin, with a few beads and some crude feathers. She was placed there with a sad and frightened look, available to anyone who had bought a ticket. In a world of exotic animals, dwarves, and skeleton men, Sarah was presented as the boundary between civilization and barbarism. During the show, she was made to smoke a pipe and obey Dunlop's commands like a pet. She was natural, with no frills or bulging clothes, and had what women craved and men sought. In front of everyone, Sarah's buttocks were fondled and crudely examined. But far from the extraordinary exoticism attributed to them, both her imposing buttocks and the extraordinary hypertrophy of the lips of her vulva were features of her ethnicity. The ceremonia gripped the city. Her name was on the lips of high society. Her spectacle quickly became a favorite of the masses, and drawings and caricatures covered the pages and covers of newspapers. Thus was born the Hottentot Venus, a term now derogatory used by the Dutch to refer to the Khoi Khoi. In 1807, the British government outlawed the slave trade, and although it had not yet done so with slavery, it was already frowned upon by some groups. So much so, that the humiliation and exploitation to which Dunlop and Caesar subjected Sarah drew the attention of the anti-slavery movement, prompting questions and protests. Activist Robert Wedderburn launched a campaign to free her and outlaw the vile spectacle they had staged around her. The case went to court, and both men stood in the dock. However, 
nothing could be proven, and the defendants were acquitted. The publicity of the trial, contrary to its intent, increased the popularity of the show in the English capital. Once the furor had died down, and Sarah's protuberances no longer aroused passions, the group toured Britain and even Ireland. In 1814, surrounded by anti-slavery pressure and waning interest in the show, Cheezer traveled with Sarchi to Paris. There, together with him, she once again became an exotic celebrity, drinking at the Café de Paris and attending high society parties. However, the man decided to return to South Africa, and Sara was sold to another exploiter known as Rio. His real name was Jean Rio, and he was an animal trainer. Together with him, the young girl endured months of horror and extreme subjugation. Sometimes, she was exhibited in a cage next to a baby rhinoceros. In the act they were performing, he would order her to stand up and sit down, and they would both do it at the same time. At other times, she was exposed virtually naked for visitors to fondle and dance with her in situations that, in many cases, led to prostitution. Sarah's humiliation was absolute, and the situation was degrading. She did not stop drinking and smoking to ease her suffering. But in the City of Light, no one seemed to notice such monstrous violence. On the contrary, the young woman was also a victim of scientific racism. The naturalist Georges Cuvier, Napoleon's surgeon, was so fascinated by her that he asked to keep her and used his power to do so. In 1815, a group of anatomists, physiologists, and zoologists began to study her body. Without limits and in the name of science, they forced her to undress completely, which she refused for cultural reasons. Even after so many humiliations, she was never completely naked. They looked at her, analyzed her, and painted her. They studied her female organs as objects of macabre interest and sexual connotation. And the conclusion Cuvier reached was that Sara was a link between animals and humans. Once again, the racist stereotype of Africans as an inferior race was emphasized. In 1816, at the age of 26, Sara Bartman died in Paris. Doctors claimed it was due to an inflammatory and eruptive disease. In reality, it was never known whether it was pneumonia, syphilis, or alcoholism. As if all that the young woman suffered in life was not enough, she continued to be mistreated after her death. Cuvier made a plaster model of her body before dissecting it. He also preserved her skeleton and placed her brain and genital organs in jars, which were pitifully displayed at the Musée de l'Homme in Paris until 1974. Yes, 1974. In 1994, after being elected president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela requested the repatriation of Sarah's remains and the plaster model that Cuvier had made. The process took eight years. In 2002, the French government allowed her remains to return to her home country. On August 9th of that year, she was buried on Hankey Hill, with a beautiful view of the Gamtus River, the place where she was born. Sarah was finally able to rest in peace in her homeland, although it took almost two centuries. Her life was marked by humiliation and slavery, something that is unimaginable today. It's kind of ironic how Sarah's body, a body that caused her so much pain and humiliation, some women today pay for. Rest in peace, Sarah Bartman.